Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to everyone online and um, to everyone in the room. Um, I am excited that we are continuing our um, McLean Ethics Lecture Series. And I always remind people where we are. So basically we finished our, um, our autumn and winter quarters and we are about halfway through our spring quarter. Um, and after Dr. Kaur speaks today, we will have four left. So um, it's been a long and successful year of the McLean Lecture Series. Um, all the recordings are online and um, we're excited to have Dr. Kaur joining us today. Next week, I'll just remind you, Dr. Valerie Montgomery Rice, the president and CEO of uh, Morehouse uh, School of Medicine will be joining us. Um, followed by Paula Martin, who um, works in comparative human development um, at the college, the University of Chicago, will be joining us talking about intervention ethics and trans youth. And, um, and then we'll have two after that and then be done for, for the year. So it's been a very um, successful year and I am looking forward to hearing Dr. Kaur's talk today. Um, let me go ahead and introduce Dr. Kaur. Um, Dr. Kaur is an associate professor of obstetrics and gynecology in the section of complex family planning and an assistant director of the McLean Center for Medical Ethics at the University of Chicago. After completing medical school at the University of Chicago's Pritzker School of Medicine, Dr. Kaur completed her OB um, and gynecology residency fellowship and fellowship in complex family planning and a master's degree in public health at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Dr. Kaur's academic and clinical work focus on, focuses on understanding and addressing barriers that adolescents and young adults face in seeking and obtaining reproductive health care. She has received private foundation and National Institutes of Health funding on her research. Um, Dr. Kaur is also a co-editor of the book entitled Reproductive Ethics and Clinical Practice, Preventing, Initiating, and Managing Pregnancy and Delivery and serves on the ethics committees of the International Federation of Gynecology and Obstetrics and of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. A dedicated educator, Dr. Kaur serves as a program director for the Fellowship in Complex Plan Family Planning and the assistant director for the University of Chicago's ob third year medical student clerkship and also co-director for the first year doctor-patient relationship course. So thank you for your service and we're looking forward to hearing your talk today. Thank you so much. Another part of my bio is I think Dr. Euler, you were like chief resident when I think I was a fourth year student. So I also have had the pleasure of being educated by Dr. Euler. So thank you. Um, let's see. I have no conflicts of interest with this talk. Um, I do want to make a disclaimer about language. Um, this talk uses the terms woman and women throughout when discussing issues of gender equity, um, recognizing that all individuals who can become pregnant and or utilize family planning services do not identify as women. Um, the terminology that is used in these slides and in this presentation is um, correlates to the language that is used in the literature that I'll be citing. So I use the language that is used in that literature and the research because that's, you know, thinking about surveys and the questions that are actually used in the research, that's the language that is used in those, um, in those studies. Um, I will address issues of gender inclusion and exclusion within family planning uh, during this talk. And I will also be focusing on individuals who were um, assigned female at birth um, throughout this talk. So that's gonna be the area of focus for, for this um, lecture. Uh, here is our slide with the CME code. I'm just gonna take a pause for a second so people can put in their code, get their credit. All right, all good. And hopefully someone could put it into the chat as well so it stays there. So learning objectives. By the end of this talk, I uh, anticipate that you'll be able to discuss the role of contraception and abortion access in fostering gender equity, describe areas for improvement in promoting gender equity within the field of family planning, and anticipate some potential impacts of abortion and contraception restrictions on gender equity in healthcare and uh, also a more of a societal level as well. So we're gonna start with a 
brief history of legal um, steps in terms of access to contraception abortion in the United States. And I start with this slide. I This is my 10 year anniversary of being on faculty at the University of Chicago. And very shortly after I started at the University of Chicago, I had the incredible opportunity to hear Justice Ruth Gader Bins, uh, Ruth Gader Bins, Bader Ginsburg, I can't remember, I can't believe I messed that up. But um, RBG speak at the law school. And this talk, or it's, it was more of like a back and forth kind of interview or dialogue, has actually been cited quite a bit in terms of um, uh, Justice Ginsburg's thoughts on abortion and the role that abortion plays um, in terms of uh, issues of autonomy and kind of her wishes of how the um, how abortion could have been handled by the Supreme Court. Um, and this was uh, marking the 40th anniversary of Roe versus Wade. Um, Justice Ginsburg said that by basing Roe on the rights to privacy rather than equal rights, Roe isn't really about the woman's choice, is it? It's about the doctor's freedom to practice. It wasn't woman-centered, it was physician-centered. So reviewing a bit of Justice Ginsburg's history, because really looking at Justice Ginsburg's history um, uh, with her involvement in reproductive health law gives us an interesting um, perspective on the progress of um, law around reproductive health and equity. So we're starting out, oh, you know, it's hard because the I think it's Reed versus, I can't see the titles. Is there a way to get rid of this? Mark, okay, yeah. Yeah, would you mind? Awesome, okay. I thought it was Reed versus Reed, but I couldn't see in the year, I can't, I can't remember. So 1971. Um, this case overturned an Ohio law granting men preference as estate administrators. So seemingly kind of um, not the sexiest of cases. Um, but really this law or this case actually was quite important in that it extended the, constitutionals, the Constitution's equal protection guarantee to women for the first time. Justice Ginsburg, not a justice then, but um, as a, a younger lawyer, uh, she wrote the brief in that case that came before the Supreme Court. Um, several years later, Strzok versus Secretary of Defense. Um, this is the case that Justice Ginsburg states she wishes had been the first reproductive freedom case to come before the Supreme Court. Um, she says, I wish that, or she said that, I wish that would have been the first case. I think the court would have better understood that this is about women's choice. The case involved Captain, Captain Susan Strzok, who became pregnant while serving as a nurse in the Air Force in Vietnam. And Captain Strzok was given the option of either having an abortion or leaving the Air Force. Captain Strzok wanted to both continue her pregnancy and remain in the Air Force. And so she sued. J uh, Justice Ginsburg argued the case and the case went um, to higher courts or district courts, didn't make it to the level of the Supreme Court because the Air Force um, through, throughout this process abandoned the requirement of um, pregnant people to terminate in order to remain in the armed forces. So um, this was a great advancement, but um, didn't quite make it to the level that um, Justice Ginsburg had hoped. Um, and really she, she viewed this because she thought that this would be would have been a great case to bring uh, up the issue of abortion as an equal rights issue. At uh, Ginsburg's confirmation hearing in 1993, she stated that abortion is something central to a woman's life, to her dignity. It's a decision that she must make for herself. And when government controls that decision for her, she's being treated as less than a fully adult human responsible for her own choices. So though perhaps Justice Ginsburg um, may not uh, have you know, thought of herself as an ethicist first and foremost, I think that this really does crystallize some issues around um, reproductive health, reproductive freedom, and issues of 
bodily reproductive autonomy and justice. So I think she really sets the scene for this discussion. So I'm gonna take you through some of the key cases and policy changes uh, throughout the past 150 or so years that really lay the groundwork for access to and then restrictions um, from a use of abortion and contraception in the United States. So in the 1860s and the 1880s, there was a, an explosion of state level anti-abortion legislation. Prior to that, um, things had really been um, not so clear. There's a lot of, um, uh, there, there just wasn't very much clarity in terms of kind of legal status of abortion. The AMA actually played a pretty crucial role in this, and the Committee on Criminal Abortion, led by Horatio Storer, um, who was the committee chair and an OBGYN, um, insisted that women must remain within their God-given sphere. All states in the United States banned abortion by the, eight, by the end of the 19th century. The Comstock Law, which you may um, be hearing about recently in relation to the current um, debate and legal issues around mifepristone and medication abortion. Um, Comstock law at the federal level was passed in 1873. And this was the act for su the suppression of trade in circulation of obscene literature and articles of immoral use. And really this law and the subsequent state laws, state Comstock laws criminalized the use of the postal service to send contraceptives and abortifacients. 1936, the U.S. versus one package, the U.S. Uh, Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit allowed the importation of contraceptives, so going against the Comstock laws, to U.S. doctors for use by their patients for pregnancy prevention. And in 1960, the FDA, again, kind of at the center of a lot of debate lately around abortion, um, first approved the uh, oral contraceptive pill Inovid. And this was really the first approval of an oral contraceptive or a modern contraceptive in the United States. 1965, Griswold versus Connecticut, the Supreme Court ruled that the constitution protects the rights of married couples, very importantly, married couples, to buy and use contraception without government restriction. And importantly, Griswold established the concept of right to privacy in intimate practice. In 1972, in Eisenstadt versus Baird, the Supreme Court established the right of unmarried people to possess and use contraception. And this was based on the fact that the um, a Massachusetts law that was being uh, brought to court violated, again, equal protection clauses of the Constitution. So these laws, as they're being passed to expand access, um, are working around the concepts of privacy and also equal rights but mostly around privacy. And in 1973, of course, is the Roe versus Wade decision and that the Supreme Court ruled that, that the constitution guaranteed the right to abortion. And this was really based on the right to privacy as supported by Griswold and Eisenstadt. I'm skipping over a lot of legal decisions, but I wanna give you some of the most um, salient cases that really impact where we are today and also impact people's access throughout the past few decades. In 1992, Planned Parenthood of Southwest Pennsylvania versus Casey, the Supreme Court decided that after viability, a state can forbid abortion as long as it has exceptions for life and health of the pregnant person. Um, but prior to viability, states could, could not ban abortion, but they can regulate it as long as the regulations do not impose an undue burden. There are many, many cases and um, debates about what constitutes an undue burden, um, but I'm just gonna cut to the chase by going to 2022 because this really um, largely uh, uh, negates those debates and that's the Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health decision that, that was made in um, the summer of 22. Uh, the Dobbs decision, overturned Roe versus Wade and stated that abortion is not a federal right protected under the constitution. Abortion laws and rights are to be determined at the state level. Very importantly, again, when we're talking kind of in the next section of this, um, as I go to the next section of this talk, 
Justice Thomas, in his um, concurring opinion, wrote that in future cases, we should reconsider all of this court's substantive due process precedents, including Griswold, Lawrence, and Ogerfeld. Um, just to remind you, Griswold was the case that uh, expanded or allowed the right to, to um, the use of contraception. So just to kind of put that out there and thinking about where the future may go um, based on this Dobbs decision. So not surprisingly, in the wake of the Dobbs decision, uh, a lot of dominoes have fallen with regards to uh, legal access to abortion in the United States. This is the most current map uh, that reflects um, state laws. You will see that um, Illinois is, <clears throat> excuse me, a blueberry in a um, kind of bowl of red or a sea of red. Um, and so this is kind of, I'm not gonna go through each state, um, but there have been uh, 18 plus states that have highly restricted or banned uh, abortion. Um, and you know what, Florida, Florida was in the news, I think just this week, um, there's a six week ban that was signed uh, by the governor of Florida, um, but that is kind of on pause until the Supreme Court of Florida decides what they're going to do with another law um, that banned abortion uh, at the gestational age of 15 weeks. So this is kind of where we are. You know, I started the um, very beginning of this talk at um, my, uh, you know, privilege of hearing Justice Ginsburg speak on the 40th anniversary of Roe versus Wade. And here we are um, uh, 10 years later at the 50th anniversary of Roe versus Wade and, and the world looks very, very different in terms of access. So now I'm gonna turn more directly to the topic of modern contraception and abortion and its role in supporting gender equity. Some of the outcomes that have been examined with regard to gender equity and the relationship with family planning include educational attainment, workforce participation, career outcomes, and wage gaps. Um, you know, just thinking about what ways in which abortion and contraception may uh, uh, contribute to gender equity. Uh, smaller cohort size, like a smaller family size, may be associated with increased financial resources for current and subsequent family members and even generationally. Delaying pregnancy may increase educational attainment and involvement in the workplace. And there's also the concept of the expectation effect. And that is one's ability to time whether and when to parent can inform a person's aspirations in life planning. And so these may impact engagement in the workforce, career choices, and advancement. And just to give an idea kind of pictorially, um, you know, sometimes a picture uh, is worth a thousand words, right? So this is a, a graph showing, again, as I stated, um, the FDA first approved modern contraception, the birth control pill, specifically in Novit in 1960. And this is a graph of live first birth rates by age of the uh, pregnant person or mother in this graph. And you can see that the lines of um, those who are 18 to 24 at first birth really decline precipitously after the, the, the FDA approval of the pill. Um, and then things kind of plateau and straighten out in 1976. And that was the Planned Parenthood of Central Missouri versus Danforth decision, where the Supreme Court ruled against a state's interest in regulating access to contraception based on age alone. So um, really kind of equalizing access to contraception for those married, non-married, and regardless of age. Another graph that helps to illustrate changes in the wake of uh, access to modern contraception. Um, this is the distribution of age at first birth by cohort. And you can see the one cohort, um, uh, the two cohorts actually that are substantially different from the rest are those who were born in 1955 and those who were born in 1960. And so these are uh, people who grew up with access to birth control, uh, modern contraception, so uh, birth control pills. So you can imagine um, these changes had important impacts on per, uh, people's ability to pursue education, to engage in the workforce. And so we'll look at some of this historic data. 
Now, as you can imagine, there are many challenges to establishing any kind of causal relationship between abortion and contraception and gender equity. In the 1960s and 1970s, we didn't just have FDA approval of the birth control pill and Roe versus Wade. There are a number of legal and policy changes that can impact um, gender uh, equity, including 1963 Equal Pay Act and the 1964 Equal Rights Act that expanded legal, legal rights in the workplace. 1972 Title IX of, educational, of the educational amendments, um, college and graduate school admissions were enhanced for um, women. And in 1978, the Pregnancy Discrimination Act um, established the legal rights of women in the workplace who experience pregnancy or childbirth, right? So the, the kind of the family planning access um, uh, progress was not isolated. It, it was within this milieu of, of many other advancements at the policy and legal level. So again, some challenges to establishing this causal relationship also include confounders. Right, there are factors such as socioeconomic status, race, ethnicity, age, insurance status, parents' education. And these are all predictors of fertility-related outcomes. Not surprisingly, these same factors are also associated with economic outcomes. So it's really challenging to isolate the effects of contraception and abortion from socioeconomic demographic factors and legal policy advancements that also contribute to gender equity. So here's where I venture into the world of econometrics um, and looking at historic data to try to start to tease out the, um, the portion that may be attributable to contraception and abortion. Um, and these approaches control for relevant, or attempt to control for relevant socioeconomic factors, but they're unable to account for all. Um, they may compare those who continue a pregnancy and those who miscarry, um, but miscarriage actually may be related to issues of access to care and socioeconomic factors. So that's not really a perfect comparison group. Um, other studies examine the implementation of policies that lead to differential access of contraception. I'm really focusing on contraception largely throughout um, the states and even at the county level. Now this data allows for comparison of women in same age cohorts with different access to contraception and abortion with likely much less variation with regards to the other kind of federal changes that were happening that may be impacting gender equity. Um, so looking at family planning policy and, and funding heterogeneity, um, some concepts that are really focused on in this literature, this econometric, econometric and historic data, is the concept of early legal access. And as I said, one of the first groups that gained access to contraception were married women, okay? And so most unmarried women under the age of 21 did not have legal access to contraception in the 1960s. States legalized access for single women of the ages 18 to 20 over the next two decades. Public funding also varied tremendously, again, from state to state, county to county. Um, and these changes rolled out also over the next two decades. And so comparing data at the state and county level allows for controls, uh, to, allows one to control for factors and to better isolate this relationship between family planning and economic outcomes. So we're gonna focus on a few of these kind of major outcomes. So starting with career attainment. Golden and Katz examined the uh, early legal access to birth control pills and found that this actually accounted for about a third of increase in women in professional careers between 1970 and 1990. And this was, you know, a, a third increase sounds very substantial, but um, actually this, this overall was an increase of 5%. Um, and one of the major limitations to their study is that they really only examined college educated women. Um, Steingrim's daughter uh, examined self-reported uh, career plans and found that women from more selective colleges increased their expectations for career attainment um, more, uh, significantly more than those from less selective colleges um, uh, when considering early access or legal access to contraception. So 
individuals who are in the more selective colleges felt that the, the access to birth control pills increased their career prospects, whereas actually um, individuals from less selective colleges felt that the birth control pill may have had a neutral or even potentially a negative impact on their uh, career prospects. So really it's, it's uh, very mixed data in terms of the impact of birth control pills um, for the general population. So these are very um, limited studies. Looking at educational attainment, Edlin and Machado examined changes in marriage laws to evaluate minors access to contraception without parental consent and how that impacted educational attainment. Um, they found that laws decreasing the minimal age of marriage the, led to increased minor access to contraception. And that accounted for about a 10% increase in the probability of women ever attaining college. So people who had access to marriage in turn had access to contraception and their, um, their kind of data showed that that accounted for about a 10% increase. Um, and it also accounted for about a 20% increase in women pursuing professions, including medicine and the law. Hawk also evaluated these outcomes and looked at the impact of early legal access to contraception on educational outcomes between 1968 and 1979 and found that women with early legal access had about a 12% increase in college enrollment. Um, and they posited that about a quarter of a million women over the age of 30 obtained their bachelor's degree due to access to contraception by the year 2000. Now you can imagine there are a lot of limitations to this data, but it does give us at least an idea of the relationship between access to contraception and uh, increased engagement in education. Um, you know, as I, I mentioned, in terms of career attainment, there is some differential impact based on um, uh, the nature of the school that people attended. Um, there's also a differential impact in, with regards to educational attainment based on baseline socioeconomic status. So Bailey and colle colleagues looked at college enrollment and found that it was 20% higher for those 20 to 24 years old. Um, with early legal access in the early uh, in the late 1960s and early 70s, but this increase was actually the greatest for those who had a baseline lower socioeconomic status. That is in conflict with Anant and Hungerman's finding that the association with um, between access to the pill and increases in levels of education impacted um, less those with a lower socioeconomic status. So really, um, this just gives you an idea that uh, there's a lot of noise in trying to establish a clear relationship between access to contraception and these outcomes. Um, but there does appear to be some connection between access to contraception at a younger age and increased educational career attainment. Looking at the workforce, Bailey um, looked at the relationship between early legal access and delays in parenting and found that this accounted for about a 15% increase in workforce participation and work hours in women ages 16 and 30 who grew up between the ages of 1970 and 1990. Bailey and colleagues subsequently looked at the relationship between early legal access and improved wages and found that individuals who have this early legal access compared to their peers who did not um, earned more both hourly and yearly and they found that this attributed to about two thirds of um, the impact on uh, gender um, expansion in the workforce, and also about a third um, of the increase in educational attainment and occupation. So differences in impact of family planning on economic advances. You know, just thinking about um, some challenges again in, in looking at these outcomes, contraception may have less of an impact for those with access to abortion. Um, so there are several studies that show that really when you take into account both contraception and abortion, abortion may actually have had a larger impact on increased engagement in the workforce and educational involvement. The impact on economic outcomes may be less for those from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. As I said, as I showed, there are some studies that really conflict in terms of, of how contraception helped those from lower socioeconomic status compared to higher economic status. And importantly, cost remains a barrier to access for many, both thinking about contraception and abortion. 
There's very limited data in terms of examining differences by race and, race and ethnicity. And there's very inconsistent data when we look at actually the effect of teen pregnancy on educational and career attainment. So again, you know, this is really looking at historic data, which we know is limited by nature um, and recognizing that there are a tremendous number of um, individual level confounders and also policy and legal confounders. So, you know, we have some broad strokes thinking they're demonstrating that there is some positive relationship between access to contraception and abortion and um, workplace outcomes. How about some prospective data? Because that's really what we always want, right? Um, and some of the best contemporary data um, is looking at the relationship between abortion and um, uh, outcomes, including economic outcomes and socioeconomic attainment. The Turnaway study is really a, a game changer in terms of looking at access to um, abortion specifically and long-term outcomes. Um, the Turnaway study is a five-year longitudinal study of women presenting for abortion in the United States from 2008 to 2010. This study has um, a number of spinoff papers looking at health outcomes, um, relationship outcomes, so a number of outcomes, but they also include socioeconomic outcomes. The three cohorts in the study include the near limits, and those are individuals who presented um, within two weeks under the gestational age limit of that clinic that they presented to. And that was about 450 individuals. The turnaways were within three weeks above the gestational age limit at the clinic that they presented to who were not able to obtain their desired preg uh, pregnancy termination. And then there's a cohort of individuals in the first trimester who obtained their, their abortions. So compared to those who were able to obtain their desired abortion, those who were unable to obtain their abortion, looking at six months post um, denial of their abortion, those who were not able to access their abortion had a higher odds of living in poverty, were less likely to be employed, more likely to receive public assistance. And these differences actually remained after four years. So again, thinking about the impact of access to uh, methods of determining whether and when one can become pregnant and parent, um, I think these are probably the, the most concrete um, and methodologically the soundest data to show the role of um, pregnancy planning and being able to determine when wants to and is ready to parent and how that impacts um, engagement in the workforce. Okay, so I'm gonna shift gears. Um, this talk is entitled Family Planning and Gender Equity, but I'm also going to look at gender equity within family planning. Most data and all the data that I've presented thus far has really focused on the experiences and outcomes of cisgendered females and their use of contraception and abortion. It's important to recognize and say out loud, transgender, non-binary, and gender expansive people who are assigned female at birth do have sex that puts them at risk of pregnancy. Of course, not everyone, but there are pregnancy risks amongst this population. So it's important for us to do some self-reflection as family planners and ask, how are we providing care for our transgender and gender expansive patients who are assigned female at birth? There are some important, unique contraception and abortion considerations for these patients. Um, I'm just gonna go through a few of some of the most um, uh, notable, but use of testosterone um, frequently, most commonly results in amenorrhea, so no menses. This does not mean that people who are on testosterone cannot become pregnant. This is not a contraceptive. Um, and studies of transgender patients assigned female at birth um, found that about you know, 15 to 30% believe that use of testosterone is a safe method or an effective method of contraception. And about six to 9% report being told by their provider that being on testosterone will prevent pregnancy. There are also some potential teratogenic effects to being on testosterone if um, one conceives while on testosterone. Um, there are potentially gender discordant and potentially concordant effects of being on hormonal contraception. And the invasive nature of some of contraception and abortion procedures may be particularly challenging for patients 
um, who may feel alienated by their, um, their anatomy. Importantly, uh, contraception is used by transgender men. So about 20, depending on the studies, between 20 and 60% of transgender men do report having used or using contraception. Uh, transgender non-binary individuals also do experience pregnancy. Um, Heather Moseson and um, colleagues conducted a, the, probably the largest survey um, looking at reproductive health outcomes amongst transgender and gender expansive participants, um, including 1,700 uh, respondents. Of those, they documented 433 pregnancies, and that was about 12% of the study population. Uh, just over half of those were unintended. About 40% re resulted in live birth, a third resulted in miscarriage, and about 20 resulted in abortion. And importantly, one in five respondents considered themselves at risk of getting pregnant when they did not want to be, or were unsure of their pregnancy risk. So let's kind of focus a little bit more directly on abortion amongst um, transgender and gender expansive patients. Um, there's a 2017 survey of all known abortion providing facilities in the United States. And from those results, they estimate that about 500 abortions um, are performed annually for transgender and non-binary patients. This is probably a, a, a gross underestimation. Um, abortion clinics, there's some later data, but um, abortion clinics, you know, it, you will only know what your data is if you're asking the right questions, right? And so a lot of clinics are not asking the right questions to get an accounting of, of um, the gender identity of their patients. Um, but again, returning to Moses and study, um, amongst those respondents, 92 abortions were documented. Um, about 60% were surgical, 30% were medical. And of all the respondents, there was a strong three to one preference for medication abortion if they needed to pursue abortion in the future. And respondents indicated that they would prefer medication abortion because it was less invasive and more private. Some respondents also said that they did not wanna to have to engage with the medical system out of concerns for discrimination and being misgendered. So let's think about provider training comfort with regards to caring for our transgender and non-binary patients. Um, looking kind of the broader, um, kind of broader scope of, of reproductive health providers, only about a third or less of OB-GYNs who were surveyed um, reported being comfortable providing care for transmasculine patients. 70% um, of OBGYN residency program directors report having some training in gender affirming care. And a survey conducted by a number of us here at the um, University of Chicago found that about three quarters of Illinois OBGYN residents reported feeling unprepared to care for transgender patients. Um, and as I indicated, only about a quarter of abortion clinics are really um, focused on care for transgender patients and only a quarter provide specific transgender care. So that means that about 30% of abortion patients only receive their care in clinics that um, really provide transgender specific care. So what are our patients experiences with family planning providers, um, uh, our transgender and non-binary patients experiences? Gomez and colleagues um, performed a qualitative study of 20 transgender non-binary young adults who were assigned female at birth. No, I don't, sorry, that's a B. Um, the participants described a uh, lack of knowledge amongst both themselves and providers about the impact of testosterone on pregnancy risk and interactions with contraception. Um, they also described interactions where providers were unfamiliar with the needs of transgender non-binary patients, made assumptions about anatomy, gender and sexual identities, and lack knowledge to counsel individuals about contraception. Um, one participant reported, uh, they asked how I got pregnant, how it works, how do other lesbians do it, where do you find sperm? And I was like, well, don't you work with pregnant people all day? She was well-meaning, but the questions she was asked in the questions that she was asking because she wanted to be a better provider, but at the same time, it's not my job to teach her. So just clarifying some more specific barriers for transgender and non-binary patients when trying to access contraception and abortion care. 
um, Fix et al. conducted a qualitative study of sexual and reproductive health care stakeholders, including uh, five patients who had experienced either um, abortion or contraception care, and 22 clinicians, researchers, advocates, um, and they identify the following barriers to contraception and abortion care specifically. Lack of gender affirming clinicians, gendered healthcare environments. Um, there's a lot of language about um, women and female um, in abortion clinics and family planning clinics. Um, being misgendered, discrimination and insurance coverage. Um, you know, our transgender non-binary patients seeking abortion in particular and contraception um, face a double challenge. Um, Co insurance coverage for abortion specifically is uh, very hit or miss. And of course, insurance coverage for transgender care is equally kind of spotty. Um, and also once someone has uh, legally and um, officially changed their gender within the medical record, that oftentimes can lead to challenges accessing um, uh, care deemed women's care. Um, with regard to their insurance. So, so this can be an, a major, major burden. Um, and here's just one quote from the website, uh, We Testify, which is, um, uh, I highly recommend uh, going to this site. There's a lot of really um, illustrative uh, examples, but one uh, quote is that, that as a non-binary person, I've been misgendered in healthcare settings. So if I ever have an abortion again, I would still prefer to self-manage. So this is someone who would self-manage their abortion in the past, again, out of um, concerns of having uh, issues with regards to discrimination and being misgendered when coming into contact um, with reproductive health care. Um, and so that clearly impacts how they engage with abortion care. So some recommendations um, from these study participants in terms of how to improve contraception and abortion care for our transgender non-binary patients, um, making sure that our intake forms are gender neutral and gender affirming, and affirming of all sexual orientations. And this I think can apply to most healthcare. I'm um, using gender, gender neutral language by staff. Creation of evidence-based and gender affirming patient education materials specifically around contraception and abortion, which are very much lacking. Uh, medical education, continuing medical education around gender affirming care in the family planning context. Partnering with transgender non-binary communities to ensure that changes that are being made in practice center the needs of this community, seeking to have staff that reflects the diversity of patients seeking care and family planning, and empowering those staff who do identify as transgender non-binary to help lead shift in patient uh, service delivery and culture, and advocating uh, for comprehensive contraception, abortion, and gender-affirming care coverage. Okay, so now I'm gonna make another shift um, and try to uh, move along expeditiously on family planning and gender equity in medicine specifically. So as previously was stated, um, access to contraception and abortion has been linked to increasing um, participation uh, within the workforce and in the professions and specifically including medicine. Delays in childbearing during training and beyond in medicine imply that there is a use of contraception and abortion amongst physicians in training and physicians in practice. There's really a paucity of literature looking at contraception and abortion use among US physicians. Um, an older study looking at the women's health study in 1993 to 94 included about 4,500 participants. Female uh, physicians were more likely to use contraception compared to the general reproductive age population and to women who were matched by socioeconomic status. Um, with nearly three quarters of US physicians using contraception. Um, participants in this study were more likely to use IUDs and barrier methods and less likely to use permanent contraception compared to the general population and um, uh, um, those matched by socioeconomic status. Thinking about my cohort of family planning providers and our contraceptive use, um, this is not gonna be surprising to anyone who's ever talked to a family planning provider. A 2013 survey of nearly 500 providers, ages 25 to 44, compared to um, the 2011 to uh, 2013 National Survey of Family Growth Respondents in the same age group. Um, family planners had a higher percentage of using contraception and were significantly more likely to use IUDs, implants, and the contraceptive ring. 
Uh, LARC use, so use of IUDs and implants was uh, about 42% compared to 12% in the general population. This reflects likely both um, differential preferences, but also recognizing our access to contraception. Thinking about our ob residents and their use of contraception, a 2016 survey of ob residents at the time of their in-training exam uh, uh, had an 86% response rate, 83% of those identified as women, and uh, more than half were married. Um, Two thirds of the respondents were using contraception or had a partner using contraception. And again, the use of IUDs was five times higher than the general population. And amongst nulliparous uh, uh, female participants, nearly about a third of them used IUDs and that's eight times higher than the national level. And again, this represents both increase in access financially, but also um, uh, access to knowledge. Um, looking at physicians and use of abortion, just at the national level, one in four people who can become pregnant will experience an abortion by the end of their reproductive um, years. There's really little known about U.S. physician use of uh, abortion. However, a national survey conducted by uh, a number of individuals, including um, our very own Vinnie Aurora, Dr. Vinnie Aurora, surveyed uh, 3,800 U.S. physicians and physicians in training with an impressive 82% completion rate. Um, and they found that 11.5 of those who responded reported, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, about 11.5 of those who experienced pregnancy had had one or more uh, abortions. And those who reported having had an abortion were more likely to have also reported delaying childbearing for training. So clearly abortion is common amongst US physicians though it is a little less, it is less common than uh, the general population of 25%. So thinking about, you know, recognizing again, family planning and the use of contraception and abortion certainly um, plays a role in terms of how physicians and physicians in training um, navigate the balance between family building and career attainment. Um, what might the Dobbs decision that I spoke about earlier on this talk how might that impact the physician workforce? One third of US residency programs are located within 18 states who have banned or severely restricted abortion since Dobbs. Abortion restrictions and bans also impact management of miscarriage, ectopic pregnancy and infertility. This is especially relevant to physicians, both in training and beyond, as delays in childbearing and strenuous work conditions that physicians experience are associated with increased risk of pregnancy complications. Now, this is this holds for many, many, many fields, but you know, we in this room are physicians, and so that's why I'm focusing on, on the outcomes of physicians. But the rates of complications and um, need for care for anomalies um, is quite striking amongst US physicians. So access to contraception and abortion has allowed physicians and physicians in training to plan their lives for 50 years impact of Dobbs on physician workforce is really threefold. As learners, it's going to impact educational content, medical school matriculation, and residency ranking preferences. Dr. Euler, Euler and I were just talking about the match this year. And, um, you know, I think we're, we're still going to get more data on this, but certainly anecdotally, um, Dobbs had a huge impact on how um, medical students ranked programs nationally. As providers, um, the changes in what can and cannot be offered in providing reproductive health care within the fields of ob and family medicine, but also throughout um, internal medicine, pediatric surgery, this, these changes cause moral distress, lead to moral injury, burnout, and career may impact career longe longevity for some uh, in the workforce. And finally, as patients, um, these laws and the changes in access to abortion and potentially contraception, um, that's actually not that far off, um, are gonna have an impact on personal or family health and phys physical and psychosocial health. So uh, this is a, an ethics series. And I do think that we need to bring these issues back, kind of hone them into ethical principles. 
And thinking again back to um, uh, Justice Ginsburg's words about where abortion fits within um, regulating one's own life and decisions, clearly these issues are tied very closely to both bodily and reproductive autonomy and um, undermine the principles of justice and access to um, uh, both regulating one's, one's life and life course, but also um, impacting uh, access and engagement with education and the workforce. So the principles that are fundamental to safe evidence-based provision of contraception and abortion are very much under attack. This is in addition to gender affirming care for minors and adults. And these are not um, coincidences. Uh, the people who are legislating um, or creating legislation that is resulting in abortion bans throughout the states are the same people who are creating legislation that is limiting access to gender affirming care for children and now even adults. These concerted efforts threaten advances in gender equity that have been made over the past 50 years. And so I propose that it's an ethical imperative for us to advocate on behalf of patients and especially those who are at greatest risk. So in conclusion, access to contraception and abortion has contributed to gender equity as measured through economic outcomes. Not all genders receive equitable family planning care and that's an issue that we very much need to address. Use of contraception and abortion is highly prevalent amongst US physician and helps foster gender equity in medicine. And threats to access to abortion and contraception are threats to bodily autonomy and justice and undermine gender equity both within our field of practice and beyond. Okay, and now I have eight minutes for questions. Wonderful, so we're open to questions from the room. Um, I, I was re just reflecting as you were talking about, I was wondering if there are best practice from our international colleagues um, oh. and like how that it will impact like the future in the United States going forward. So any thoughts? I, about you know either good or bad influences there. Yeah, um, you know it's interesting. Um, a couple of years ago, um, at the National Abortion Federation, um, we had panels talking about self-managed abortion, and really we were learning from our colleagues in South America, where abortion had been banned. Um, countries that, um, interestingly enough, many of whom are moving towards legalization of abortion as the United States is moving towards banning and restricting abortion. So there are a lot of best practices, but um, even with those best practices from countries that have long dealt with um, abortion and uh, really predominantly abortion being illegal, we know that even within kind of application of those best practices, um, there are significantly negative um, health and economic outcomes um, uh, when abortion is restricted and let alone contraception. And um, so, yes, there are certainly many best practices, um, but it's just, um, you know, the idea that we have to um, reach out to countries where this has been illegal for decades um, is, is pretty striking. Any other questions in the room? <laughs> Yeah. So um, the question is from Dr. Rusiecki, who is um, talking about this concept of women's health that has been advocated for a long time and how to address that in the current setting of um, gender affirming care. I hope I paraphrased that well. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, there. Uh, I, that also that question takes me back to another conference where there was very heated, vigorous debate. And there have been... Um, really notable um, ruptures in um, 
organizations and um, and kind of academic discussions around this topic. Um, you know, whether focusing on kind of expanding or, or kind of broadening the pool um, and using more gender neutral language um, undermines kind of issues that um, that have been identified as women's issues. Um, and, you know, I think that my language really has, has shifted to focus around reproductive health and, and recognizing that that can be applied to people who are uh, assigned male at birth. Um, but uh, again, for me, my language is focusing on, on more about reproductive health. And quite honestly, um, to me, what's most important is what the patient in front of me, the language that the patient in front of me is using and asking them what language they're comfortable with, whether it be with um, anatomy or procedures or, um, so I think to me, the very most important thing is at the individual level, but yes, absolutely. When someone walks into a clinic and everything is women, 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 it's very challenging. And so I, I don't think that we've arrived at like a single best practice. Um, but I think focusing on, on reproductive health and, and more gender neutral terminology, I think is more welcoming to more people. There's a couple of questions in the Zoom chat. One is, how is family planning and reproductive care for TGE patients being taught at University of Chicago for students and residents to ensure graduates are able to take care of these patients well? <laughs> That's a great question. And, you know, in terms of uh, undergraduate medical education, um, you know, I think that that is certainly something that um, is going to be uh a component that we focus on in terms of curricular reform. And certainly there is discussion, you know, uh, I'm director of the ethics course and we had a session around um, ethical care for transgender and gender expansive patients. Um, but I think that we need to actually get um, very much into the nitty gritty of practical aspects of providing this care. Um, and so that um, certainly will be a focus as we are um, working on the curricular reform in terms of clinical skills and um, uh, more concrete um, uh, kind of approaches in DPR and those other courses. In resident education, um, we have some uh, some leaders who are focusing on that, uh, Andrew Fisher um, being one of them. And so um, we are certainly very actively thinking about how best to do this, but uh, we are not, we certainly are not um, perfect and we are continuing to, to work to integrate this into the curricular um, changes. Yeah, yeah. They're quite similar. Um, so looking at um, socio-demographic, you know, we have, oh, I'm sorry. The, the question was about the turnaway study and um, the two cohorts, those, the turnaways and those who um, obtain their abortion, um, were those, you know, were the um, two cohorts very different in terms of, um, are there some factors that made them more likely or less likely to make it to the clinic um, uh, prior to their gestational age? Cut off. Um, those groups are actually quite similar. In abortion care, we've had a lot of challenges trying to identify what is the, the best um, comparison group, right? Because people with unwanted pregnancies, sorry, my eyes watering, people with unwanted pregnancies who continue a pregnancy are very different than people with unwanted pregnancies who terminate. Um, and so it's been a real challenge, but this actually, in terms of the two cohorts are quite well matched in um, most of the demographics that were collected. So this study actually from a methodologic um, perspective in terms of really isolating the, the abortion as being our uh, ability to, to obtain their abortion um, as the main difference um, was quite sound, yeah. 
So I think we'll end here. We'll stop the recording and um, and then we'll just ask the ethics fellows to come down for our final discussion. Um, Vita, do you want me to end it right here? Do you want to stop the recording? Oh crap! That was signed in when I I know went up. It's so I wasn't hallucinating. It was signed. I know. It was. Oh, that's not ideal. Yeah, that's just great. Okay, well. Wait, look. Okay, well then. It's still recording. That turn I think it was. It's like it's. It was like minimized or. Yeah. What the. F oh, sweet baby Jesus.